And, uh, we're going to jump into Psalm 32. Maybe you have a digital Bible this morning, so open up to Psalm 32. God, thank you so much for just the chance to gather again outside. Uh, God, we know things are going crazy in our world, and there's anxiety, and there's fear. But God, in you, as we trust you, we can live above all of that, and we can live with hope and with joy and with poise. And God, this morning, we're going to look at a really, really important passage of Scripture. Uh, because the problem is not what's going on out there in the world. Often the problem is really what's going on in us. And so help us, God, to see what we need to see, hear what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to invite uh, Levi to come on up. And Levi is one of our youth, and he's going to read Psalm 32. If you're able, I'd like you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Thank you, Adam. clap after. <laughs> uh, a masculine of David. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the, ma is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in, whom, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day. For day and night your hand was heavy up, up, <clears throat> upon me, my strength dried up as by the heat of the sun. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Salah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach you. You are, you are a hiding place for me, and you preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Salah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit or bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. Now you can clap. Amen. Good job, Levi. Thank you. Maybe a future pastor right there. So Psalm 32, if you are a good first century Jew, I mean, this made your billboard top 10. Uh, this was, uh, remember, not just a poem, but it was to be sung. And I imagine kind of a bluesy rock feel, maybe some B.B. <laughs> King licks, you know, in there. Um, I've been listening to some J.J. Gray and Mo Fro lately, and man, I love that guy's voice. And um, maybe you can hear a little bit of Janis Joplin's voice in there as you read this psalm. This is not a sad song, but actually a song of rejoicing, a song to celebrate for. Here at Boulder Creek Community Church, we like to say that we want to enjoy life with Jesus, with others and for others. And one of the ways that happens is that we try not to take ourselves too seriously, but we try to take God very, very seriously. And today we're going to talk about something that God does take very seriously, and that is sin. That is failure. But you might be surprised by what I mean by God taking that seriously. Psalm 32 is really about how to deal with failure, how to come out of failure with a deeper understanding of God's love and God's grace. To come out of it more mature, more joyful, more fulfilled in life. Many of the Psalms of the 150, uh, probably the biggest section of Psalms, are what are called lament songs. Lament is about grieving, especially heartache and loss. And you look in the world today and what's going on in the world, and a lot of people are lamenting. But as I said uh, earlier, Psalm 32 is not so much about what's going on out there in the world, and the brokenness of the world. And the truth is, you don't need to look far to see a lot of brokenness in our world. Business is booming when it comes to sin and brokenness in our world. Psalm 32 is more about the brokenness within. And the truth is, you and I are all experts on how to sin. No one taught us. Your parents didn't sit you down and say, here's how you lie. Here's how you cheat. Here's how you become more selfish. See, according to Psalm 32, and this is the good news, blessed, blessed is the one who is forgiven. 
We've talked about this word blessed before. It's makarios. It's, it means uh, a wellness of life. It has to do with joy and fulfillment and poi and just peace. No matter what circumstances are going on outside, inwardly, there's this deep abiding peace and joy in our lives. And that is what God has for us. Here's the thing. Perfect people are not blessed. Perfect people are not blessed. The blessed are those who are forgiven. Now this psalm, most, most of you probably know this. He wrote about half the psalms. His name is David, King David, one of the most favorite, uh, famous Bible characters in all of Scripture. He was a man who was known as a man after God's own heart. He was the giant slayer, the king, the shepherd king. In fact, every king after David would be compared to him. He was the forerunner, in a sense, of Christ, who would be both a king and a shepherd as well. And yet this psalm is written in response, get this, to David's greatest failure in life. How would you like to have songs written about your greatest failure in life? Too many. Too many songs? You got a whole album worth. <laughs> But think about this, this song has not only been sung, it has been remembered for 3,000 years. So let me give you the cliff notes on what happened and what led to this particular psalm being written. David, the Bible says, is at home when kings ought to be out on the battlefield, but he's decided to take it easy, he took a nap, he woke up from his nap and he's up on his roof and he looks down and he sees a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. And he sends his advisors and his court to go get her. Long story short, she ends up pregnant. And she sends word to him, hey, I'm pregnant. And you're the only one I've been with. Meanwhile, her husband Uriah, who is one of David's mighty men, is out there on the battlefield. And so he decides to cover his sin. And he sends word to Joab, the commander, and says, send Uriah home. And so he pretends to ask about what's going on in the battlefield, how are things going, give me some of the news, give me some of the updates. And he says, all right, thanks, Uriah. Go home and be with your wife. And you know what he's hoping is going to happen, right? He's going to sleep with her, and then he's in the clear because she's pregnant and nobody will know it was him. But Uriah is such a man of integrity, such a man of good character, that he sleeps on the ground with the guards outside the palace. He won't even go home. And when David finds out, he calls him in. He says, I can't do that. My, my comrades, they're out there in the battlefield. How can I come home and sleep in my own bed and, and sleep with my wife when my, my friends, my comrades are out there fighting an enemy? Well, David tries another tactic. He gets him drunk. Surely you get him drunk and he'll forget and he'll go home and sleep with his wife. But he did the very same thing. He slept just outside the gate with the guards. And when David found out he's not going to get through to this guy, he writes a note to the commander of the army, Joab. And he gives the note to Uriah. He says, go give this to Joab. Joab opens up the note and says, I want you to get as close as you can to where the battle is fiercest where the greatest warriors are, and I want you to get Uriah right up there in the front and then pull out and leave Uriah there. And that's exactly what happened. Uriah was killed. And so David is in the clear. Nobody knows but him and Bathsheba. I want to talk to you today about three things. The need for confession... And we're going to talk about how David gets there. We're going to talk about how to confess. What does it mean to confess and what does that look like? How do you do that? But I also want to talk about the secret sauce of confession. <laughs> the secret sauce of confession. So let's talk about the need for confession. There's three kinds of people I see in the church and in the world. People who feel that they are too good to be forgiven. I'm not as bad as those people. And there are a lot of religious people that are like this. This is the religious person who thinks they don't have any sin. They might say, oh, I'm not perfect, and I make mistakes once in a while, but they really see themselves as above everyone else. And then there are people who feel that they are too bad to be forgiven. Their sins were too egregious. God could never forgive them. And churches 
have a number of those people too. But then there are people who know how bad they've been. They know the secret sins that nobody else knows about. And, but at the same time, they know how much they need to be forgiven. And they have it. They have the peace and the forgiveness and the mercy of God. And they live in that space of knowing that, yes, I have been a horrible sinner. Someone was praying this morning in our prayer meeting. I won't mention who it is. Her initials are Trisha Franklin. <laughs> and she said something so profound. She said that she felt like the worst sinner ever. You know, she's not the only one that has ever said that. Paul said that about himself. See, when you don't compare yourself to other people, when you look at your own life and your own heart and your own motives, it's pretty easy to come to the conclusion, man, I am the worst sinner out there. But she also prayed, but you have forgiven me and I feel your love like I've never felt it before. That's what God wants for us. Notice in verse 1, he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are, and this is a really important word here, whose sins are covered. This is an echo from Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, that they were exposed, they saw themselves as naked, and the first thing they did was try to cover themselves with leaves. And if you remember the story, God said that's not good enough, and God went and killed an animal, an innocent animal, took the fur and covered their nakedness that's always been the heart of God to cover our shame to cover our sin we work really hard to control what we let people see that's why Facebook can be so dangerous or Instagram or snapchat or whatever it is that you're on you start to compare yourself, your regular, normal, boring self, to everybody else's highlights. And today we have a culture that lacks, absolutely lacks a healthy sense of shame and of guilt. Modern people want to say guilt only exists because society put these rules and religion has put these standards on people. So let's change the rules. Let's get rid of the rules. Let's get rid of the standard and then the guilt and the shame will go away. Let's get rid of these archaic standards, these old-fashioned ways of doing things. We'll make up our own rules. What's true for you is true for me. It might not be true for me, but it's true for you. Do what's in your gut. You know, that might be true, picking out a color to paint your bedroom in or your office, but when it comes to God's moral and ethical standards, it's not good enough. You know, we can even abandon our traditional morals of right and wrong. We can say that we don't believe in heaven or hell or right or wrong. And yet, there is a deep sense in every one of us, whether you're an atheist or a follower of Christ your whole life, there is something deep within us that knows a deep sense that something's not right, something's broken. And I found that most people even if they don't believe in a standard of right and wrong, if they don't believe in a plumb line, they can't even live up to their own standard. They can't even live up to their own standard of what they consider to be right and wrong. And so we cover. We cover deep down. We all know that there's something wrong with us. And this is why some people in our culture are so driven to get more, so driven to success, however they define that. It's why some people are just absolutely crushed and devastated if someone criticizes them. It's why some of us are so concerned about what we look like in the mirror. Or so concerned about what certain people might think of us. Or maybe some of us just live with a deep sense of guilt and of shame and we don't even know why. We just feel wrong. We feel broken. I think in our culture too, we also have a misconception of what it means to be blessed. And that's why I think that we struggle with living in the joy and the freedom of being forgiven. If we really, really grasp how much we have been forgiven for, we would not be apathetic about our faith. 
We would not be ashamed to tell other people about the good news. It is good news, by the way. We tend to think of being blessed when our circumstances exceed or meet our expectations. But if they fall under our expectations, then we don't feel blessed anymore. And in our culture, when we talk about sin, we compare it to chocolate cake. Augustine said this, and by the way, Psalm 32 was one of his favorite psalms. He used to, in the last days of his life, he read it every single day, many times a day. He kept it right there, a copy next to his bed. He loved Psalm 32. And one of the things he said was, the beginning of wisdom is to know oneself as a sinner. So let's talk about how to confess. Let's talk about how to confess. And I want to give you three ways or three things to think about when it comes to confession. Distinguish between true guilt and false guilt. Look at verse 3. David says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away as though my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as in the heat of summer. And you look at the timing. This Most scholars think that David, but when he committed the sin and when he confessed the sin, was about a year long. And so he was living for an entire year ignoring God, going on about his business, never admitting that what he had done was wrong. Not only did he commit adultery, he murdered a man, her husband, to cover it up. But I wonder how many of us might be living with something, and maybe it's been longer than a year. Something we know we need to address. A person that we need to reconcile with. A sin that we need to give up. Uh, something that we need to begin to do. But we need to learn to distinguish between false guilt and real guilt. How are you going to know the difference? And the way you know the difference is we all need a straight edge. We need a plumb line. You cannot build a building without measurements and have them be exact. Otherwise, you get something that's chaos and out of control and is not going to be stable. We need a straight edge. There has to be something outside of us that is going to tell us whether we are guilty or not. Proverbs 22 says people may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines the hearts. See, we can't rely on our conscience. Remember Jiminy Cricket? Remember what Jiminy Cricket said? Okay, if you're young, maybe not, they never saw that one. What was that, Pinocchio? Uh, Jiminy Cricket, rely on your conscience. Let your conscience be your guide. If it feels good, how can it be wrong? But I want to remind you, and I've said this before, Hitler followed his conscience. And so what do you do when your conscience condemns you? What do you do when you have a sense of guilt or I'm wrong or shame? Well, you measure it by God's standard, not your own standard. And, and, and when you do that, maybe that even makes you feel more guilty. Well, I'll never measure up to per perfection. Uh, in the men's group on Wednesday night, we've been studying 1 John. In fact, we're going to look at this very verse this week. John asked the question... What do you do if your heart condemns you? What do you do if your heart condemns you? And then he says, God is greater than your hearts. He knows everything. See, sometimes we feel guilty and we shouldn't. Sometimes we don't feel guilty and we should. So we need to distinguish between true guilt and false guilt. And the way we do that is we measure it by God's standard. We use God's standard as a plumb line. And by the way, all sin, and this is really important, all sin is ultimately against God. I may sin against my brother or sister in Christ, but that sin is also an offense against God. I'm reminded of the story of Joseph. Joseph was a young man. He ended up in slavery in Egypt. He worked his way up. He was well-trusted, well-respected. He worked in Potiphar's household. And Potiphar's wife said, hmm... I want him. Day after day after day, he pressured, or she was pressuring him to sleep with her. And he kept saying no. He kept resisting. And then one time, 
She grabbed him and said, why don't you sleep with me? And he said this, how can I sin against God? Very interesting response when you think about it. And you know the story, he ran, she kept the code, he ended up in prison for doing the right thing. So sometimes there's a price to pay for obeying God. But the second thing we need to do is distinguish between grief and self-pity. Grief is good. Self-pity is not. And how do you tell the difference? Verse 8 says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule. This is important. Which have no understanding must be controlled by a bit and bridle. Or they will not come to you. In other words, it's saying don't be like a mule. And I'll keep it clean. Some of you already went there. Don't be like a mule. A mule will go wherever it needs to because it has to, because it does not like the pain of going its own way. In other words, a mule is not sorry for their sin, but they're sorry for the pain that their sin might be causing. And so grief looks at the actual offense and grieves about offending a God who is so perfect and who is so loving and has given so much on our behalf. But there's something that's very different than just being upset because you're experiencing the pain or the consequences of your disobedience. <laughs> and so don't be like the mule. My son, my grandson, I'm sorry, was walking away from his mom the other day. Uh, she, she called us and told us about this and I thought it was so hilarious and so cute. When you see your kids suffer a little bit <laughs> with their kids, you're kind of like, yeah, you're learning now. You're learning. But he was walking away and she said, no, as I, every parent does, every parent says, no, that's out of bounds. That'll hurt you. That's no good for you. He walked away and plugged his ears. <laughs> it was cute. But it's not so cute when you and I do it. And we all, we've all done that with God. We said, no, 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 no. I'm going to do what I want to do. And this is why some Christians never experience life transformation. They confess, but not really. They repent, but not really. They don't like the pain, the consequences, the discomfort from sins. But they are never sorry for the sinfulness of their sin. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See, there's two different ways to grieve about your sin. And the third thing I'll say on this is take responsibility. And that's exactly what David did. He didn't make excuses. He didn't play the blame game. He said in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover. There's that word again, cover. I did not cover my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. David uses three words interestingly in this passage. You might not pick it up in some of the translations, but if you read the ESV, you get three different words related to sin. You get the word transgression. Think of transcontinental rail railway. It has to do with crossing over, crossing a line. And then you have the word sin that he uses, and sin means literally to miss the mark. It was an archery term in ancient times. It was very sad, by the way, uh, if you watched any of the Olympics, the American Matthew Emmons, the sharpshooter for America. He'd won a gold five years ago. And he was one shot away from getting the gold in Japan this year. One shot away. He lined up, aimed, bullseye. But it was the wrong target. It was the wrong target. So not only that knock him out of gold, it knocked him out of silver, it knocked him out of bronze. One little mistake. One little mistake. By the way, anybody know what this is? That's for a toilet. That's for a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know that we had a little flood on Wednesday. One little stupid piece. It broke. We don't know how old this is. We don't know how long it's been there. 
but fortunately it was not dirty water yeah. it was clean. clean water clean not maybe not drinkable but clean <laughs> and it put about a half an inch in, over the entire church that's a lot of water that was water was flowing all night long by the way i gotta say thank you to jill jill was the second one on scene with her what do you call those things Steam cleaner. It sucks up water. She had just gotten off a shift. I think she'd been up all night, and she was here for about four or five hours. Uh, Russ was here. Cindy was here. Uh, who else was here? Jeff. Jeff, oh my gosh. Jeff is not only was here cleaning up the water, he also was working with the carpet cleaners, and he comes here four times a day to empty the humidifiers, which is sucking up all the water out of the air. Can you just give those guys a hand for their amazing sacrifice and hard work? But in a lot of ways, this reminds me of sin. Call it iniquity, call it transgression, call it sin. It's just a small thing. But it had huge implications, didn't it? Sometimes we can destroy our lives, even with a small flaw in our character. Now, the good news is... We were going to meet outside anyway. We stacked the chairs last Sunday, those of you who are second service, so all the chairs were already stacked. We are going to clean the carpets anyway. They're clean now. <laughs> so I just love how God can bring good even out of what could have been just a horrific disaster. And so we give thanks to God. And so David uses the word transgression. He uses the word sin. He also uses the word iniquity. And iniquity is the idea of twisting something is, that is good and making it bad. Maybe you've had someone take something you've said and they twisted it just a little bit. And then they gave it back to you. And you're like, that's not what I meant. You're twisting my words. And so David, by using all three of these words, you know what he's doing? He's owning it. He's owning it. He said, I did that. And so forgiveness has to do with covering. Uh, forgiveness has to do with canceling a debt, a debt that you could never pay, a debt so high you have no hope, but the debt is paid. And it's also about lifting, lifting a burden, a weight that just weighs you down. If you remember, his bones were aching as if, as if he was in a desert and a you know, starving and thirsty, he just was wasting away physically because he had let this rest on his conscience for far too long. And it was lifted. It was lifted because he experienced forgiveness. And because he experienced forgiveness, that's why he could say, blessed is the one who confesses. Blessed is the one who admits. And so let's wrap this up with the secret sauce. Okay, we talked about what confession is and how to confess. But the secret sauce of confession is to change your hiding place. Remember I told you Adam and Eve, first thing they did when they realized that they had disobeyed God, they hid. And you and I hide. We hide behind all kinds of different things. But notice David didn't run from God. Notice he didn't try to hide from God when it all became clear that he was wrong he ran to God instead of trying to cover himself in his shame and his guilt he ran to God to find covering in him he says you are my hiding place I'm going to quit hiding from myself I'm going to quit hiding from other people I'm going to hide in you, God. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. Whenever you read Selah, just think of B.B. King playing just for a couple minutes. Just, just a nice, beautiful musical lick. See, every religion has its standards. Every person has its standards. The invoke thing in America is to kind of go through it like a salad bar. And you know, I like this, I don't like Brussels sprouts, I like this, I like this. And you kind of create your own religion. And so every religion has a standard and says, meet the standard. Be good enough. But what if you can't? 
What if you can't meet the standard? See, that's why we celebrate the cross. That's why we take a symbol that was a symbol of death, one of the most excruciating ways someone could die, and we celebrate it now as, as a symbol of grace and of love and of forgiveness. And I'm always reminded, and I've said this before, when we look at the cross, we want to remember two things. Yes, you and I are that bad. Jesus had to go to that extent to pay for your sin. Even yours, Wilma. I know you've never sinned, at least in the last decade. But even your sin. But at the very same time, that symbol is also a reminder that you and I are that loved. That he would go to that extent to demonstrate his love for you. Now, you might not pick this up in your English translation, but there's a lot of scholars that think that this song is not a solo. It's actually a duet. It's as if God steps in and joins David in the song in verse 8 and 9. And what that reminds us of is that God takes sin seriously. Yes, he doesn't compromise his standard. But he takes sin so seriously, and then he steps in and says, I'll handle it. I'll pay the price. I'll accomplish what you can accomplish on your own, and that is forgiveness. I will cover you. I will cover your guilt, your shame, your sin, so that you can be right with him. And so he takes sin so seriously that he calls it sin, and then he does something about it, and he does something for us. Jesus was uncovered. Think about the cross. He was bared naked. Don't pay attention to what you see on the movies. He was completely bare naked and he was uncovered so that you and I could be covered Jesus was spit upon mocked shamed so that he could take away your shame and mine and he took on our guilt to set us free from it second Corinthians 5 21 says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him that is in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. As you take communion this morning, take a minute and just let that thought marinate on your mind for a minute. He who knew no sin became sin for you so that you might experience the righteousness, the forgiveness, the mercy, the love that God has for you. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this beautiful psalm. It is so foundational, so essential to understanding what it means to follow you. And to live a life that is free from guilt, free from shame. To live a victorious life, to enjoy life with you, with others, and for others. And so God, we take these elements, this little cup of juice and this wafer, and we're reminded that you were uncovered so that we could be covered you were shamed so that you could take away our shame and you were uh, you took on our guilt so that we could be free from it and we do this in remembrance of you in jesus name and all god's people say Amen.